Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OUG Young Professionals Forum's December webinar. My name is Samantha Ogon, and I'm the OUG staff liaison for the Young Professionals Forum. This call is being recorded, and you are all currently on mute, but we do highly encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions at any time during this webinar, don't hesitate to write it in the question box in the GoToWebinar um, <coughs> box that's on your screen. We will answer questions during and after this webinar. Before we start the educational portion of this call, I would like to give you an update about the OUG Young Professionals Forum and other educational and networking opportunities that are available to you with the OUG, and then I'll hand it over for an introduction to our speaker. So the OUG is a place to receive educational resources that come from users like you. So if you want to learn more after today's webinar, you can find resources on the OUG website, which is www.oug.org. Members of the OUG are able to download conference papers from past Collaborate, sign up for the e-learning webinars that are coming up, or read helpful articles from in Insight Magazine. In addition, OUG Pro Tip videos, which are open to members and non-members, you can find these on our website under resources, and they give you short tips under five minutes um, to help you with your day-to-day. -day. Or don't forget to check out our geographic or special interest groups to network and learn with professionals in your area or learn to a specific topic area. And you can explore the different topics and download by going to oug.org. Another opportunity to learn more is at Collaborate. <coughs> Collaborate 17 is April 2nd through the 6th, 2017 in Las Vegas. This is the place to learn and network with other Oracle application users in a positive and collaborate atmosphere. There will be over uh, 1,200 sessions and panels as well as peer-to-peer -peer networking available at the conference. Sessions were just added on our website, so if you're curious to see the topic areas, make sure to visit the collaborate.oug.org website. And if you want to attend but need help justifying your trip to your boss, um, we have a template with a customized letter for your manager, uh, expense worksheet to calculate the Collaborate ROI, and a benefits document to show you how to get approval um, in a tip sheet form. You can visit collaborate.oug.org slash registration slash justify to uh, find those helpful tips and worksheets. In addition, there is the OUG Young Professionals Forum. So if you're here today, you found that um, probably on our website. But we're a group that helps you get your career started on the right foot and build your professional network with peers and mentors, stay up to date with Oracle Applications community, and as a place to share helpful information or to ask questions and discuss information. And so our next event will be at Collaborate. It will be the Young Professionals Cocktail Meetup at Collaborate 17, and you can say that save the date, but we'll also have an RSVP this year, um, starting in January, so keep an eye out for that. And I'd also like to mention that the OUG Young Professionals Forum is run by volunteers, so if you'd like to get involved in the planning process, if you, or if you have an idea for a future webinar, or maybe just general questions about what we do, you can find our contact information on the OUG website under membership and then Young Professionals or you can email membership at oug.org for any questions. In addition to volunteering with the Young Professionals Forum, we are also asking for volunteers for the Meetings and Conferences Committee to help with a new collegiate program. Um, you would participate for a couple of months in 2017 to help plan topics and formulate ideas for the new educational program that would take place at a college campus. So if you're interested in that volunteering, um, opportunity, you can email me. I will also send an email after this webinar um, that will help you um, with this information. So if you are interested in this or the young professionals, um, you can just email me to get um, involved with any of these opportunities. All right, so now let's get started with our webinar, Outlook Optimization Training. I have a young professional committee member on the call who's going to introduce our speaker. Ty, would you like to kick things off? Sure. Thanks, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ty To, and I am a technical developer for Vitamix Corporation. Uh, I'm very honored today to uh, have the opportunity to introduce you all to my friend and colleague, Evan Fleischer, 
Evan is an outspoken proponent of Outlook optimization, and he has been practicing and preaching the OO methodology for over five years now. When Evan first joined Vitamix over four years ago, he went on an instruction tour to educate the rest of the organization. Uh, to date, he has now hosted 33 training sessions and has taught over 220, uh, 220 Vitamixers, uh, which is truly amazing to me. Uh, it is not an exaggeration to say that the OO methodology has not only altered Evan's life, but the rest of the Vitamix organization as well. And I hope after this session, uh, maybe some of you will feel the same way. Uh, without further ado, please welcome the avid golfer, movie critic, foodie aficionado, and Yelper elite, Evan Fletcher. <laughs> Ty, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to take some time with all of you uh, to present this scheme, um, something that has uh, truly changed and transformed my own life, both professionally and personally. And I know it kind of may seem silly to uh, hear something like that, like that about a simple tool like Outlook, but uh, hopefully once you uh, see this presentation and understand the compelling reasons for why you would want to make this change, you'll kind of feel the same way and be as excited as I was to start applying uh, these tools in the right way. Uh, before I get started really quick, uh, Sam, is my screen presenting okay? Yes, Evan, your screen is presenting. Just that's great. Okay, thank you. So um, before I get started here, I want to just give a brief introduction about myself so you all know uh, who I am and, and, and what I do. Um, I, I wish I was still a young professional. <laughs> I've been in the work world now for 24 years, um, all of it in a supply chain support role. Uh, as Ty mentioned, I'm also uh, an employee here at Vitamix Corporation in Cleveland, Ohio. For those of you that don't know Vitamix, uh, we make high-performance blenders uh, for both uh, uh, professional, commercial, and household uses. And uh, all of the worldwide Vitamixes are made right here in, in Cleveland, Ohio, in my backyard. Uh, so I'm very proud to be working for this organization. Uh, I, I'm an industrial engineer by training uh, from Georgia Tech, and I also have an MBA with a focus in operations from the Cranert School at Purdue University. Uh, as I mentioned, I've uh, been in the work world for 24 years all in some form of uh, supply chain support. Uh, my current role here at Vitamix is I am the senior supply chain business analyst. I report to our IT infrastructure and I liaise between our supply chain operations and our IT department to uh, ensure that we are improving our supply chain operations on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a little bit about me. Um, also, as Ty mentioned, uh, I've been following this Outlook optimization scheme for a little over five years now, and it's been very transformative as to the way that I work and live my life. And so I'm going to um, spend the first part of this presentation um, with what I call um, the, 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 the engaging reason why you need to make this change. So uh, making a change like this, changing the culture of the way you perform your work is hard to do. And, um, you have to have a compelling reason to do so. Uh, I can see that we have a lot of callers that have joined us, so hopefully that's your initial interest in this topic and that's why you're here, but I still want to present to you a compelling reason why you want to make this change. Once we go through that part of the presentation, then we're going to jump into uh, another document that I'll present called the Starter Kit, which kind of outlines the steps required to make this change technically within the Outlook tool. And um, by way of examples and anecdotes, I will walk you through those steps so that you can see what it will take to make that conversion within the tool itself. And that's generally speaking where we have the most interactive part of our session where we'll be, you, you all will be asking questions and hopefully it will guide our discussion farther as we get into this presentation. So without further ado, the, uh, the compelling reason and, 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 and why we want to change the Outlook Optimization Scheme. So the first question I typically ask my audience is this. If you had your inbox uh, with zero emails in it, what would you go and do right now? So I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about that. Probably some of you are chuckling like that will never happen. But the reality is it's possible. And um, how I would normally answer that question is I'd probably go do something strategic. I'd, do, I'd work on a project. I'd work on something important. 
as opposed to simply just trying to answer emails. So that's the first kind of thought-provoking um, step here I, I want you to get in your head. You know, there, there is a way to get your, your inbox down to zero and, and, and have time to actually spend on value-added strategic initiatives. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at forging the habit of using Outlook as it was designed by Microsoft and calmly accomplishing anything you want. You can see the graphic here I have, which represents no bells and whistles. Um, in today's day and age, with all the technology we have available at our fingertips, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether it's computers or tablets or phones, smartphones, we're distracted all the time. And part of the basis for this scheme is to reduce those distractions. Another, another thought provoker here that I want to present to you. We've all heard this phrase, knowledge is power, and I want you to take a moment to think about it and whether and ponder, do you think that is an accurate statement or not? The, the reason that I bring this, this forward, uh, by way of an anecdote, I'll ask you a question that I want you to think about. What if I sat here today and I told you that I had discovered the cure for cancer? That's probably a, a pretty powerful statement to make. So do you all think that that, that knowledge is power? And when I ask that question in the, in, the, in the presentations that I make, you often get mixed results, but by and large people usually, usually do say, yeah, that's very powerful. You could cure cancer and save people's lives. And then I always say, well, let me ask the question in a slightly different way. What if I sat here today and I told you that I had the cure to cancer, but I never told another living soul? And that very quickly changes people's minds to think differently about the statement that I made, right? Because the fact that I have the cure to cancer is simply knowledge. I don't turn that into something powerful until I share that information with other people. So why am I bringing that up? Well, the knowledge in and of itself is not what creates the power. It's the sharing of the information and more importantly, the acting on that information that creates power. And outlook optimization, believe it or not, can be that bridge to transforming knowledge into power because outlook is simply a tool for gathering information. And if you use that information properly and share it with others to actually produce actions that gain results, then you've created power. How do you do that? One of the most important ways to do that is by creating focus. Think about trying to not just do more, but accomplish more. Think about all the hard hours that all of us put at the organizations that we work at or in our home life. Well, there's got to be a way to work better hours and not simply more hours. One of the things I want to discuss briefly is a sleep cycle analogy. So um, we've all had this happen, right? We're getting ready to go to sleep at night. And you're in that initial stage of sleep. It's kind of light sleep. The lights are out. And you, you're feeling yourself drifting off to sleep. Um, and the dog barks, or the phone rings, or the baby cries, or whatever happens, and you wake up out of that sleep. When that happens to you at that stage of sleep, you actually have to start your entire sleep cycle over again. In the middle of the night, though, when you're in your deep, flight, deep sleep cycle, and you get woken up by the same thing, you often fall right back to sleep. And many times, you may not even remember that you woke up in the middle of the night. But you still wake up refreshed. But when you, when you get um, disturbed in those early cycles, cycles of sleep, you have to start that entire process over again. And what scientists have come to discover is while you're awake and in your modes of deep focus, a very similar cycle and pattern occurs. So you can be working on something and get distracted because a pop-up comes up on your computer that you have an email or your phone rings or your coworker comes up to ask you a question. And then when you go back to your task, you in essence have to start that deep thinking cycle all over again. 
We need to find ways to remove those distractions and create very focused time. So this is a very busy slide that I'm not going to read through, but it's another example of focus uh, that I want to talk about that also points to this Outlook optimization scheme and why Outlook itself as a tool is so important. So back in the early 1920s, Stanford, a, a prominent uh, psychologist at, the, at Stanford University named Lewis Terman decided he was going to conduct a study over the course of 60 years to follow 100 genius level children throughout their lives and observe if being uh, selected as a genius level intelligence as, as a young person translated into success as an adult. So um, what they found out after 60 years of performing this study into the 80s was that this group of 100 seemingly genius level people turned out to have a, 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 a nearly identical um, uh, outcome is to that of the general population, meaning some people were at the bottom and completely struggled through life. There was a bunch of them in the middle that had average lives and a few people at the top that had very successful life in everything they did, their life, their marriage, security, finances, everything. So what happened was the fact that they were uh, determined to be genius from an IQ perspective as a child was ruled out as a direct correlation or a reason for their success as an adult. And so what did they find out through this analysis was, long story short, the one variable in all the things that those top people did that had success in their life was they finished what they started with a single point focus. And they really had a whole you know, life worth of observations to prove it. And it turns out that Outlook, as I mentioned, is this ultimate single point focus tool if it's used correctly. So moral of the story, if you're not a genius, which I am certainly not, uh, it's okay to just utilize tools properly, reduce your distractions, and finish the task that you start and success can be yours, whatever that success may be. Um, this slide I have left in this presentation because it comes from my own Outlook optimization mentor, a gentleman named Jason Hankel. Um, I, I use this kind of as a talking point just to kind of put credence into this system. So a little bit about um, Jason and my history with him. Um, I used to work with Jason, my previous company, the Vitamix, and um, I had been given a promotion toward the end of my tenure at that company. And uh, Jason happened to be on this team that I was working on. And as we started to have our uh, team meetings and I would pass him by in his office, I noticed he was a young guy and he seemed like a very go-getter type of a person. Anytime we had a meeting and our boss asked for volunteers, I need somebody to help with this, he was always the first guy to raise his hand. And when I walked by his office, it was always incredibly neat and organized. And he was always an incredibly positive and outgoing guy. And one day I went up to him and I said, Jason, how do you do all of this? How, how do you manage your, your work life the way you are and stay as positive you are and get in, involved in things as you do? I said, you know, I'm an anal retentive OCD engineer, and I think I have my act together, but I, I can't do what you're doing. I'm overwhelmed by what I'm being asked to do. And he said, well, Evan, I discovered this program called Outlook Optimization, and it's changed my life. And I said, wow, that sounds really intriguing. You know, can you tell me a little bit more about it? And he did. And then I said, if you're ever interested in teaching other people how to do this, I'd be one of the first people to sign up. And, 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 and shortly after that, sure enough, he created a class at this organization on his own, kind of an organic class, and he started teaching other people this scheme. And that's where I learned it, and I took to it right away, kind of drank the Kool-Aid, and have been using it ever since. And again, the reason why I kept this up here, I want to show the type of kind of depth and breadth of exposure uh, and responsibility that Jason had in his job at the time. Jason was a 15-year Franklin Covey user. For those of you that are not familiar with the Franklin Covey system, since many of you are young professionals, I'm not sure you do, uh, but it was a, a big planner system, a paper-based planner system, kind of looked like the size of a Bible, a lot of people called it their Bible, and it had a section in it where you can write down people's contact information, it had a calendar section that you could look at daily, weekly, monthly calendars, a place where you can write down notes, 
or jot down tasks that you needed to do. Does any of this sound familiar? Because I hope it does, because it's the precursor to the electronic version of Outlook, which has all those same functions in electronic form. So he was a paper user of that system. And then you can look here um, through his customer base and the things that he had going on. You know, hundreds of field personnel um, responding to him, asking for requests, multiple projects ongoing, contact with vendor relations, community programs. And he was receiving, let's call it on average, about 100 emails a day that he was having to manage and service in somehow. And he kind of threw his hands up at, point, at some point and said, I need some type of a next level organization system that is faster, is more dynamic, that allows multimedia input and output, and, and works in a digital world. And that's when he stumbled across this Outlook optimization scheme that he went and, and went to a presentation and then kind of customized it for his needs, and that's the presentation you're seeing here today, and that's the scheme that I promote um, for use today as well. So let's take a minute here and ask ourselves a few questions. Again, I usually look for shaking heads and, and hand raises, although I can't do that here. At this point, based on what I've told you, do you feel you're, that you use Outlook as it was designed by Microsoft? I would guess probably not. Many people of you probably don't know this scheme and its availability. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the book um, by a gentleman named Stephen Covey called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's really an outstanding book. He was kind of a motivational speaker. Uh, he wrote this book. It was kind of a, a everybody must read kind of a book back in the 90s. And, and unfortunately, uh, Mr. Covey passed away a few years ago from a bicycle accident of all things. But the, the name Stephen Covey should sound familiar because I just mentioned the, the Franklin Covey planner system and he was part of the developer of that, of that system, that organization system. Um, probably most of you here have never used a Franklin Covey planner. I used to have one years ago before, before we had Outlook, but um, it was a great system, but it had its limitations because it was paper-based. And then lastly, I know a lot of you are going to be shaking your head yes to this one or raising your hand. Who uses their inbox as their to-do list, right? So I know a lot of Ty is shaking his head. He used to do the same oh, thing. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> oh, boy. And, and we all did, right? Because you don't know any other better way. you got to keep track of everything that's coming in. And so you, you leave messages as unread, or you put a flag on them, or try to set a, a target date to them. Um, but it becomes ineffective because it's hard to manage that, especially as so many new emails are coming our way every day. So I want to tell you a little bit about my observed impact in using this Outlook optimization scheme for a little over five years now and what, and what happens in my Outlook world. I, I pretty much go home every night with zero emails in my inbox. And if you think about, I mentioned earlier Jason's situation of a thousand, e I'm sorry, a hundred emails a day, that translates to actioning or managing reading an email every five minutes of a nine hour day almost impossible to get anything done. So there's got to be a different way to do it. And there's got to be a better way to manage emails coming in. And like I said, I go home every night with, thing, with zero emails in my inbox. And that does not mean that I'm simply deleting them or throwing them into an unread folder. I'm actioning these emails. And we'll talk about that as we go on here. I go home every single night with no worry of forgotten actions or things or workloads still over because of the way I'm managing the actions I know that I'm responsible for. I've accidentally become 100% paperless. It's not really a goal of this system, and it kind of just evolved over time. But I've come to find out that in the past world of things where you needed paper and to-do lists and notes from people, I've 100% eliminated all that stuff and do everything electronically. Again, that may be hard for a lot of people, given the security blanket you have of your steno pad that you go to meetings with. or um, handouts from meetings or, or, or things of that nature, but there's a way to do it and, and, and really reduce the amount of paper and clutter that you have. I kind of feel like I can take on any workload. That doesn't mean I always try to take on any workload, but I don't feel overwhelmed like I used to because of the way that I manage the, the tasks that I have in my life now and the actions that I'm required to perform because of the use of this system. And really it ends up turning itself into 100% stress-free changes in plans, tasks, timing, because utilizing this, systems allow, utilizing this system allows me to quickly change between tasks without any worry about losing anything because of the way you manage information under this scheme. So hopefully 
those impacts sound intriguing to you and might be a compelling reason why you'd make this kind of a change yourself. I always love to show these, these next two slides. So um, I always, often ask, you know, would you like your desk to look like this? Some people may be chuckling that their desks uh, and workspace look similar, uh, or maybe even worse, I don't know. Or maybe you'd like your, your desk to look like my workspace, which has no paper. And uh, unfortunately, I often have people say, Evan, do you, do you actually work here? What do you do? Because you never have anything on your desk. Well, it's because of the way that I manage my workload. And I mentioned it's all electronic. And this is what my workspace looks like every day. So this slide, um, I would typically flip over to the internet and show you all a 10-minute video um, from a website called TED. I'm sure many of you are familiar with TED Talks. There's a very, very interesting TED Talk by a gentleman named Nigel Marsh called How to Make the Work-Life Balance Work. He's also kind of a, a motivational speaker. He's um, from, from England. And um, I love his TED Talk. It's very brief. And I'm not going to play it now in the interest of time. Um, I will encourage you all, if you download the, the, the presentations, to go get this link or look up Nigel Marsh on TED and listen to this TED Talk. It really gets to the heart of what it means to create an appropriate work-life balance. Many of us probably uh, don't respect an appropriate work-life balance. And for me, that's an incredibly important part of my life. And this scheme helped me create a much better balance in that sense. And there's a couple of takeaways from this video that I want to talk about briefly that when you listen to the video yourself, you'll, you'll take away, I think, as well. The first of those is, be, is if you don't design your work day and your personal day for that matter, someone else will design it for you. And you may just not like their idea of balance. Um, and, and you'll see some of that as we go on into this whole Outlook optimization scheme and the setup of it. If you're simply looking at your inbox and reactively responding to emails, you're letting other people dictate how you design your day and your life. I don't run my life like that. And I would encourage you not to run your life like that as well if you could avoid it. And this scheme will help you get out of that um, drinking from the Outlook inbox fire hose scheme that you might be in in your own life. The other takeaway um, is on a similar vein, don't let others own your time by knee-jerk reacting to emails that come in every day. It's, it's OK to let an email sit and stew for a little while if you have other things that are more pressing. I'll talk a little bit more about that during my, um, the rest of my presentation. But just think about those, those concepts and, and becoming the architect of your own life and doing things on your own term and not on other people's terms. So here's the kind of the entire Outlook optimization scheme on, and the concept on one whole slide. So this is how it goes. Hide your inbox all day long and work with your calendar task dashboard showing. So that first statement right there is probably pretty shocking to a lot of people because most of us live in our inbox. I prefer not to, and there is a different way. And we will discuss that as we get into the, the actual technical setup of the scheme it, itself. This next one always caused people's eyes to bug out. Turn all email notifications off and greatly reduce interrupted thought. So remember my sleep, sleep analogy from earlier. Um, if you're constantly being interrupted and distracted, it's really hard to create focused time to work on strategic, important things. And those little distractions, the pop-ups, the sounds, the buzzing, create those distractions. And you can remove all of them. Think about our um, scheme before of receiving about 100 emails a day and getting, having to respond to one email every five minutes of a nine-hour day. If you had a person that works for you or a colleague that came and disturbed you every five minutes, I don't know about you, but I'd fire them just like I'd fire email. I wouldn't want those type of distractions. So again, there's got to be a way to reduce those distractions and create focus. So the concept, again, would be to, quote, walk to your, your mailbox between your tasks. So think about your mailbox at home, right, in your, in your apartment or your house. How many times do you go to that mailbox a day? 
I don't know about you, but I generally go once a day, and potentially if I'm looking for something important and I, can't, I walk out and the mailman hasn't come yet, I may go out there one more time during that day to look for mail, but I'm not going out to my mailbox all the time. And I'm not also advocating that you only look at your mailbox you know, once a day, but living in your mailbox and again, working on somebody else's timetable is not how I choose to live my life and not how I work. So there, there is this optimized habit that you need to develop if you're going to follow this scheme, and it goes like this. First of all, most importantly, is to look at your calendar. What obligations, at what time have I committed to? So that you'll see that the things that you have in your calendar are not reminders necessarily or, or tasks, but it's I've made a commitment to be at such and such a meeting or to, to, to do this specific thing. That's what you're going to focus on first, because those are the things that are most important. Secondly, I'm going to look at my task list. What do I have planned for me to do today? So I'm going to look through those, those tasks and say, what's important to other people that I've committed to do, or what's important to me that I've committed to do that day? And lastly is to look at your inbox. What do others have planned for me to do today? And it's not that I'm putting my colleagues or my, my customers, internal or external, last on the list. Because, quite honestly, the things that I'm doing from an obligation perspective and from a task perspective are all for the benefit of other people, especially in my job as a business analyst supporting our operations. But I want to make sure that I'm doing things that provide the most value for the organization. And just because something is an emergency or important to you at the moment doesn't mean it's important to me. So that gets prioritized third, quite honestly. So that's the entire scheme um, in a nutshell. It doesn't, doesn't look all that difficult from the surface. And so what I'd like to do now is to break away from this presentation document and take you into another document that is provided as um, a handout to this uh, presentation called the Starter Kit. And what it does is it technically walks you through how you change the setup of Outlook to meet the needs of this optimization scheme. And what we'll do then is walk through the steps, not necessarily in detail, step by step, but I'm going to show you how to do this, the steps from a high level and give you some anecdotal stories about how to use it uh, or how to, how to make the setups. And that's going to give us the time now to move into hopefully a more interactive session. Uh, so I think, uh, Sam, I'm going to take a quick pause there to get a drink of water. And um, maybe people have some questions at this point as I prepare for this next phase of the presentation. And if you do have questions, please type them in the questions box. Um, and around where you'll find the question box in your GoToWebinar um, panel, there also that's where you'll find the handouts. They're already there for you to download. Um, so if you do want to go along with Evan um, page by page, go ahead and download that so you can do it with him a little bit better. And if you don't have questions right now, just feel free to, I'll just remind you to um, ask them at any time and we'll, we'll, I'll get them over to Evan. Yeah, thank you, Sam. And I, I would encourage people as we start going through this, if you have the opportunity to have your Outlook uh, open on the computer screen in front of you so that you can kind of um, look along if you, if you want to kind of play around as we go through the presentation, feel free to do that and please feel free to ask questions as we go. I'd prefer a methodology where we, where you all ask and I answer questions as we go as opposed to waiting till the end. It's more effective if you ask questions as we go. So let me give you kind of a rundown here of this Outlook Optimization Starter Kit document, which again you can download as a handout to this presentation. Um, Table of contents, we have about, there's about 16 steps here that I'm going to talk through that help guide you through the techni technical setup of Outlook. And the way that I'm going to do is just go step by step, kind of walk you through the setup of that slide so you'll understand how to use it yourself. And then what I'm going to do is bounce back and forth between this starter kit and my actual Outlook and show you some of the tips and tricks as we go through and set up some of the setups. And again, I hope that will generate some of the questions for this group. So the first thing that you want to do that I mentioned in the Outlook optimization habit, the optimized habit, 
is to kind of live in your Outlook task dashboard view. And to do that, you need to change Outlook because probably most of you know today, or if you hadn't thought about it, I'm going to make you think about it right now. When you open up Outlook at the beginning of the day, it opens up in your inbox. So you're, in, in essence, being forced into that method of being in your inbox right away. And there's a different way to do that. I force myself into this Outlook task dashboard view so that I can see, again, what are the commitments I've made to other people and what are the things that I've planned for myself to do today. So how do you do that? This is going to be very hard to read on the screen, but basically what I've done here is created screenshots of the areas that you go in Oracle, uh, I'm sorry, Oracle, excuse me, Outlook to make these changes. And so this very first change, and many of these are under the options um, uh, pull down menu in the file tab of Outlook. So what you would do then is you would go to and I'll do it here on my computer screen. You would go to File and Options. And Advanced. And right here, that very first step tells you to go to the Outlook Start and Exit. And you can have Outlook start up into any aspect of Oracle that you choose. So. Most of the time it's pointed at your inbox. I happen to point it at my calendar, but you could point it to your notes or to your contacts or anything else. But in this case, you want to have it pointed to your calendar. And then when you were to restart Outlook, you'll see that it opens up directly into your calendar view. So that's kind of how that first step goes. Any, if you have any questions about that, please ask. The next part of that is changing the view from not only your calendar, but to what's called the calendar task dashboard. And that is done through this small window at the bottom part of your calendar where you ask to view the tasks. And that's what creates this view here for tasks. I'm going to kind of um, project ahead a little bit here. Um, you've heard me mention the term action and task a number of times during this presentation already. The absolute key to this optimization scheme is a function within Outlook called task. It's how I manage everything that I have to do. And it's wildly powerful. Um, it ties directly into your calendar. It can be date-driven, time-driven, um, variable, digital media, content-driven, and um, being able to see this view is the key to um, knowing what commitments you're making on a day-to-day -day basis. So this step two kind of guides you through how to get that view. And again, I'll flip over to my Outlook. And you can see I've got that same view here. This portion of the, of the view is my calendar in a daily view. And below are the tasks that I have uh, planned for myself today. So while I'm here, I want to take a, a minute just to talk about this view and, and some important things here and kind of some tips. So on the left side of the, your, your screen, typically you'd see maybe one or two months worth of calendar. And one of the great tips that I have is to grab this, this uh, little bar here and by shoving it down, you can create a view where you can see more months of your calendar if you choose. Um, which can be helpful if you need to quickly bounce to some future date. So I highly recommend you doing that. And the other tip that I have to create kind of more viewable or usable space is probably many of you have an outlook that looks like this, where you can see these large buttons for your various functional aspects of Outlook, mail, calendar, contact, notes. And if you grab that bar and shove it down one at a time, you'll quickly see that those icons turn into kind of a compressed icon at the bottom of the screen. They're all still the same icons, and you'll just get used to over time knowing which icon represents which area. But look how much extra space I have that I can create a view for more calendars or more of my colleagues' calendars, if that's important to you. But it basically creates more usable space on your calendar view where you can easily flip between your various functions. So hopefully that's a good tip for you. The other thing I want to talk about is the actual calendar view itself. 
Uh, as you can see, I am in the daily view, but you can easily flip to a work week view, which is Monday to Friday, a week long view, which adds the weekends, a monthly view, which I use very rarely. By and large, when I'm at work, I use two views. I use the daily view, and occasionally I use the work week view if I want to preview the rest of my week. But most of the time, I work in simply the daily view, and that's probably another kind of an uncomfortable or awkward switch for people that are normally working in a week-long view. The reason I do that mostly is because the only day that I have really any power over or effect over is today, of course. I don't have really any power over what happened yesterday, and I can't really um, predict or have power over what I'm going to do in the future tomorrow. And so I really want to focus on, again, the commitments I've made to other people today and the tasks that I intend to perform today, and less so focus on what happened in the past and the future. I can always change my calendar and go look at another day or look at a works week view if I need to see what a preview of what I'm doing tomorrow, but I don't want to focus on those days. I really want to focus on today. So this is, generally speaking, the view that I use most of the time. Any questions at this point about the, the first few steps that I've presented about changing your scheme? Evan, I have a question. Okay. So, Fair Environments, we're using Outlook uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, for other organizations that may be using different versions of Outlook, uh, such as 2013, uh, you know, <coughs> Web Outlook, whatever the case may be, are they still able to apply these principles to those versions? Yeah, so if you, if you didn't hear the question, Ty was asking, here at Vitamix, we're on Outlook 2010, and, and I'm presenting to you this information in 2010. Can, out, can this scheme be used in other versions of Outlook or potentially even other tools like, let's say, um, uh, Lotus Notes, for instance, if your organization uses that? I'd say at a high level, the answer is yes, right? So the tools, um, uh, the, the concepts of Outlook optimization are universal. The tools themselves may change, so you may have to do a little digging to figure out. I, I don't personally use Outlook 2013, either at home or, or at work, so I don't know what it looks like exactly. But I would assume that the basic functionality of using a calendar in this methodology and tasks in this methodology or an inbox setup in this methodology works kind of universally across the tools, where you may have to make slight modifications from a technical perspective to invoke the concepts and the process that would be universal. So hopefully that answers your question, Ty. I'm going to move on to the next step. Uh, the next step, and I know this one probably caused a lot of consternation when I brought it up, it's the turning off of email alerts. Uh, basically, this is again done from your file pull-down menu in the options section. and. Um, Basically, there are some check boxes under alerts that create a, a visual alert. There's an audi auditory alert. Um, and then I would also recommend, if you don't do this, because many of us have uh, uh, smartphones or cell phones that are um, provided to us by our work organizations that have the same type of alerts that pop up, a blinking light, a sound, a vibration, I would turn those off as well. Um, again, I, I can sense probably a lot of you are squirming in your seats to hear this one, um, but let me tell you this. I've been doing this for five years, and I still remember the day. It was back in the day, five years ago, when I started this scheme, and, and Jason said, Evan, turn off all your notifications. And at that time, I had a BlackBerry, which many of you used to call a CrackBerry, if you ever had one, uh, for the organization I worked for. And I had it on set on vibrate. I didn't want to disturb other people, and so I'd put it in my pocket, and I'd leave in the car to drive home, and my work drive home was about 15 minutes, and the, the phone would start vibrating in my pocket while I'm driving, and I was good about keeping it in my pocket and not looking at it, but it was always that temptation, and so my drives home were always so stressful because I could, I could sense that somebody was contacting me, and I didn't know if it was important or not, and then I'd get home and pull the thing out, and it would be something minor, right, or it was after hours, and it was something I could deal with the next day, and I was in essence, stressing myself out over nothing. And so I instituted this scheme and turned those alerts off, and it reduced stress in my body to a level I couldn't believe. It was, it was liberating to take those alerts and turn them off. And again, I, I keep going back to that whole creating a scheme of focus and reducing distractions. And this is, to me, one of the number one distractions that we have control over that allow us to create the focus that we want and, and, and 
remove those extraneous uh, interruptions from our really important strategic thought, thought time. And I highly encourage you to try this. It's liberating. So in, in terms of thinking of that, I want to offer another anecdotal um, option here that I, that I have had brought up to me as a question before. So I've made this presentation to various uh, levels of groups here at Vitamix. And a couple of times I've had some of our more senior folks say, Evan, I, I just don't see how this is possible because I have an ear of our CEO or one of our executive leadership team. And if they're sending me an email, I want to be able to respond to it right away. And so I said, that's a, that's a very fair um, challenge to this scheme. I said, what if instead of as a rule that you have these alerts turned on, as a rule you turn the alerts off, but you create an exception to that rule, which you can do through Outlook, that says, if I receive a message from the executive leadership team, and you can call out their names, or the CEO for that matter, then provide that alert. If it's really that important to you and you want to make sure you're staying on top of it, create a scheme where you manage your exceptions instead of managing your everyday as a rule. So again, I want you to start thinking differently about how using Outlook as a tool. And that kind of leads us into the next topic, which is called inbox rules. I don't know how many of you know about them or use them, um, but really what this is is it's a filtering mechanism that you can turn on in your inbox, so as messages are coming to your inbox, you can do a number of things with them. So let me give you a couple of examples. One of the examples I just gave you, right? I could set up a rule that says when a specific email comes in with a, a certain subject in the subject line or from a certain person or group of people, do X. Notify me that that email came in. Forward it to my assistant. Send it to another email address because I'm out of the office, whatever. You can do those types of things. Uh, another popular rule is to um, kind of like a junk mail filter. If I receive an email from th with this subject line or from this email, send it to my trash folder or send it somewhere else. That's another popular thing to do. So there's different ways to use these rules. And this step number four talks about how to create inbox rules. Um, there are multiple ways to set this up, but the easiest way to set them up is when you receive an email into your inbox and you determine that you want to create a rule for that type of an email, whether it's based on a subject, on a person, on a, um, a type of attachment, you simply right click on the email and go to the section that says set up the rules. And then you, it's kind of like a, um, uh, a, a dialog box that walks you through the steps for how to set it up. So it's pretty simple, um, and again, you can do a number of things with this technology to filter your emails and create less emails in your inbox. So why would you want to have less emails in your inbox? Well, I want to tie it back to something that I mentioned before, two different things. Number one, responding to, on average, 100 emails a day is almost overwhelming. So if you can simply reduce the volume of email coming into your inbox that you have to sift through, you're ahead of the game. So creating these rules simply reduces that clutter of email. And instead of dealing with 100 emails a day, maybe you're dealing with 70 emails a day. Right? So you've reduced the amount of emails that you have to deal with. It's a fantastic tool for helping with that. And secondly, one of the rules I mentioned that you could use it for is to filter out junk mail. So that's a great way to take things that you're not really interested in and filter it into your trash bin or somewhere else. But I would say, in response to that, if you're getting a lot of junk mail, because we all do, you sign up for something interesting, like um, a user group, or a newsletter, or, or, or a magazine subscription, and then your name gets sold, and all of a sudden you're receiving all this extra mail, instead of creating a rule that just dumps that junk mail into the trash, you could just click on the unsubscribe link at the bottom of those emails and completely unsubscribe from them. Um, I know some people in today's day and age are concerned about that from a security perspective because if it's a, a phishing scam, it may actually lead to somebody validating, oh, this is a good email address, and you end up getting more. So kind of that's a buyer beware, you know, proceed with caution. It's your choice, but here's a way to reduce that clutter by using these tools and simply reducing the number of emails that you have to sift through. 
so that the, the, the emails that do come into your inbox truly are those that create importance or the nuggets of wisdom. So hopefully that's a good little set of tips for you and how to manage your inbox and how the information comes in. I'll pause there again for a moment so I can grab a drink of water. Uh, questions, concerns? Sam, anything coming through on your end? Um, I don't have any questions at the moment, but if anyone does have a question, please type it in the question box or send it to me in the chat, and I'll be happy to pass it along. Very good. Thank you. So um, the next little, well, actually, let me just take you quickly over to my Outlook itself and show you what my inbox looks like. So this, this is my inbox. And I didn't try to pretty it up or clean it up for this presentation, but you can see I have one email in here. I mean, I, I handle the emails that come into my inbox on a, you know, a fairly ongoing basis, not living in here, but coming in kind of triaging these, these emails and, and what I call actioning them on a daily basis to ensure that I manage the content that's in here and keep it current. So one of the things I wanted to talk about over here, if you look on the left side of our directory tree that we all have, Probably most of you have an inbox as well like I do, but below it, you probably have a huge directory of other folders and subfolders to categorize and subcategorize your emails. That may be by person, it may be by project, uh, it may be by department, I don't know, but a way to categorize, categorize and um, be able to quickly, hopefully quickly go find an email. Notice that I have nothing. Right? So I don't manage my emails that way. Um, and I don't action the emails in my inbox that way. I do one of two, I would do one of three things with the emails that come into my inbox. I read it and I delete it because it was simply something that's informational and I don't need to action it in any way further. I don't need it for anything, so I read it and I delete it and it goes to my trash folder. Second thing is I read it and I recognize that it is related to some action that I have ongoing or task that I have ongoing or maybe that is an email that generates an action or task that I need to perform and I will embed that email in the task and then I delete it out of my inbox. I'll explain that process here shortly as we get more into tasks which I mentioned is, mentioned is the critical element of the Outlook optimization scheme. And thirdly, Hello, Evan? yes. Oh, sorry. I'm going to ask a question for you. Do you want to sure. finish this thought? Yeah, let me finish um, the thought. And then, okay. Let me finish the thought, and then you can ask the question. So the third thing that I would potentially do here is I read the email and recognize that I don't want to delete it, but it's not part of an immediate action or task. I may need it in the future. I do have my one little cheat folder down here that I call the keep folder, and I'll simply dump that email into the keep folder with no rhyme or reason, and you can see none of them are unread. I just leave it here for a period of time, and if I find out after whatever period of time I choose, six months or a year that I don't need it, I, I archive it or I delete it. And so that's how I manage my inbox and make sure that there are no emails that um, get old and stale in my inbox and everything stays current and everything stays manageable. So Sam, I'm going to take a break there. You said you have a question. Yeah, and I think it kind of um, relates to how you ended that last um, piece of information. The question is from George, and he wants to know how do you effectively use the archive feature to keep your inbox lean and trim, i.e., do you use the built-in archive folder, do you build your own, or something else? Uh, a great question, George. So I'll try to answer that, I guess, in a couple of ways. Um, I can't speak for everybody and how you have Outlook set up at your organization. Um, for us, the way Outlook is set up on a network, our um, PST file, which is the personal information file where all of your content in Oracle gets gathered, actually resides on a network drive. Outlook. You said Oracle. I'm sorry. I keep saying Oracle because we're Oracle here. On Outlook. I apologize. The Outlook PST file. Uh, resides um, in a network space, not on my hard drive on my computer. So I don't want to say that it's unlimited, but I have probably the ability to create a larger Outlook PST file, being that it's on a network drive than on a, um, than on a personal drive. But the things that I do to manage it, I do, I do uh, several things. First of all, I don't save a million emails. 
And so many of us probably get emails that have attachments, and those can be sizable in today's day and age, um, project files and Outlook, um, um, I'm sorry, Microsoft Excel files, et cetera. Um, what I try to do is a couple of things. I try to, number one, not save those emails. So that keeps the, the, the Outlook PST file small and my Outlook inbox small. Um, as I embed important emails into a task, I will delete, and that makes a copy of them. You'll see that here shortly. I don't leave the copied version in my inbox. I delete it. So there's only one version of it. Uh, the other thing that I do frequently that I'll talk about when we get to tasks here very shortly is I will take those important uh, documents and save them onto a network drive and then reference them through a hyperlink. So the document itself resides on a network drive and is not taking up space in Outlook, so I can keep Outlook neat and trim. And I will simply reference it through um, a hyperlink within my task, which also does some cool things that allow version control and easy access to those files um, and, and a single point of, of information that you can't really do once you have that information embedded. So George, I hope, hopefully that answers your question and how I keep those files small. The, out, the uh, archive function itself I do use on a periodic basis, kind of annually. I will go through that keep folder um, as I probably have a few thousand emails in there that I save over the course of a year. And then on an annual basis I go back two years, because I usually keep two years worth, I'll go back to that year that's rolling off and archive all those emails off and get them out of my keep folder and then just co keep the most recent year. And that's how I manage the size of my PST file. Very good question. Any others at this time, Sam, or should I soldier on? Um. One, and I think it's because I interrupted your last topic, but um, was that they missed the number three action when you, um, the third way you deal with incoming emails. Uh, could you just repeat okay. the last? Sure. So the third action was for me to um, look at the email, recognize that I don't want to delete it because it may require some kind of actioning in the future, and I don't have an action today that I want to create for it or apply it to, so I put it into this kind of little cheat, the one cheat, cheat folder I have called Keep, which is the folder that on occasion, you know, on an annual basis, I will archive out the old messages. So it's just something that I keep around for a period of time in case I might need it, but I don't in any way catalog it or try to organize it because the search functions within, or within Outlook are very, very powerful, and so I'll just go and search for it and find it that way as opposed to trying to create a scheme for finding it later. So I'm going to move on with our steps here. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about, we talked about setting up inbox rules. The next step is to utilize a function within Outlook called Categories. I don't know how many of you use this. Um, categories is exactly what it implies. It's a way to create a grouping or categorization of information. Um, the, the starter kit um, talks about where to go and how to actually set up those categories, which I'm going to show you here. It's this button up here. Um, and if you click on it, you can see the various categories that I have set up, as well as if you click on the All Categories button, that is how you set up your own customized categories, which you can have one, you can have a million or any number in between. They can be any color scheme you want. They can be all the same color or different colors. They can have any name that you want. Um, I've tried to create a scheme that's fairly simplified and allows me to, at a very high level, the reason that you create categories is for visual purposes, for the most part. It allows you to group things together and look at them quickly. If you're looking here at my categories and at my daily view of the calendar. I have a category called development, um, which this presentation today follows under that category, which is why it's green. Uh, I have uh, an, an MBO or an objective uh, category, so those are my important meetings. Uh, those are highlighted in yellow, and I, you can see here I have a personal category and then three different kinds of project categories um, to show things that are blue chips and in Vitamix lingo, that's the most important projects we should be working on. 
our regular in for me regular in process projects are red and then stalled projects are purple and again you can look at my calendar today or if I even flipped it to my weekly view let's say and you can easily from a color coding and categorization perspective I can look at my day and see how things line up the other nice thing that that's used for that categorization uh, is universal within your version of Outlook meaning once you get it set up you can use it for emails you can use it for your for your calendar, you can use it for tasks, you can use it for notes, you can use it for your address book. So if I were to flip over to my um, notes, you can see that I have notes related to development or notes related to personal and notes related to project and the same thing for my tasks. So I can look at by category, I can look at the task. So it's just a way to, to group things together. Hopefully that makes sense um, and it's easy to set up and easy to use if you're a visual person of which I am. So next I'm going to show you um, something called quick shortcuts. Quick shortcuts are a really cool little tip. Um, if you get used to using this you can save precious seconds during your day as you're creating new entries in Outlook in the various functional aspects of Outlook. So the control and the shift key, if you look at your keyboard, they're the two keys on the left side of the keyboard, they're right next to each other. That's the ones that I get used to using. So with a quick keystroke, control, shift, Q, or K, or M, or A, I can create things like a new task, a new meeting request, a new appointment, a new email. So if you are, for instance, in your calendar and thinking about doing something, and realize that you need to send a quick email. I'll show you that. So if I'm in this view here and I'm looking at something that I'm working on uh, with somebody else, I'm inside this meeting note and I say, oh, I, this reminds me I need to send Eric, in this case, an email. I can simply hit Control-Shift-K, it opens up a new window, enter his name, and you know, away we go. So that's kind of how that functionality works. Um, that you can quickly open some, something new right where you are, control shift K, I get a task, control shift A, a new uh, appointment, control shift Q, a new meeting notification. And you can do that from within anywhere you are in, in Outlook and just a quick shortcut to save some time. Post-it notes, the next function within Oracle, uh, within Outlook, one of the big main kind of four or five uh, functional um, uh, pieces of technology that you have within Outlook. So post-it notes are exactly what you might think they are. If you think about a physical post-it note is the yellow sticky note that you have probably all over your desk or your computer screen or your wall reminding you to do things or telling you a password or reminding you of the steps to take to log on to your benefits page at work or whatever it is. That's what Outlook notes are. They are sticky notes. And this tells you how to use them. As I mentioned before, you can create categories for them. But something about them is really important that I want to mention and how to use a note versus how to use a task. Because the next thing we're going to talk about is Outlook tasks. And there's a really important distinction between the two that I want to make. So here's my Outlook notes. And here's an example of one. So here's a listing of all the conference rooms at Vitamix and the phone numbers associated and the type of projection um, equipment that are available in those. If I'm going to set up a meeting, I want to know how many people I can have in there. As a business analyst, I do a lot of meetings and, and coordination of people, and so I need this kind of information at my fingertips, and I don't want to have to remember it, so I'm using this as a cheat sheet. Okay, And that's the key that I want to talk about of why a note is different than a task. You want to think about using notes as a cheat sheet to remember things that you don't use very often. I have a quick link within, or within our Oracle system for how to get to our various environments, our development and test and production environments. And this allows me with a one-step click 
to get into uh, those environments because I don't really want to remember this entire URL for how to get in there. So how is a note different than a task and why would you use them differently? As I mentioned, a note, think of it as a cheat sheet. So if it's educational or informational, it's a note. And if it's actionable, it's a task. And really what drives that and why that, important, that distinction is important is that a note in, um, in Outlook is very limited in its usability and scale. There's only two kinds of information you can put into a note. You can put text and you can put a hyperlink. You can't make any other graphical uh, input here. You can't tie it to uh, any specific actions you're going to do. I can't embed other types of media. It's not time bound. And so it's very limited in its scope of use. And so again, think about this as simply, just like you would a regular post-it note, a cheat sheet for informational purposes only. You can still create categories, um, but that kind of limits the extent of what you use them for. So let me give you a quick anecdotal example of how I used to use these notes and, and why it's wrong. And it's actually a personal example. So I, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, and for those of you that don't live in the north, I actually grew up in Miami, Florida, so I didn't have to do this in, the, in my past. But um, living here, I have to go through a, uh, like a home winterization process every year where I drain my sprinkler system so that I don't crack pipes and bring in our rain barrel and and food composter and bring in our, our deck furniture and the hose reels and all of that type of action. And in the past, I had a note with a list of all of these things that I needed to do on an annual basis. And uh, a couple years ago, before I was using Outlook optimization, I had this list and I forgot to perform the step of winterizing my sprinkler system. And one day my neighbor called me and said, hey Evan, there's water spraying out of something on the side of your house. And to make a long story short, I had busted the overflow valve because it froze. And it cost me several hundred dollars to fix in the spring. So lesson learned, right? The use of that as a note was inappropriate. Because even though it was a list of things to do, it was something that I needed to action. And so at home, in my own personal Outlook optimization scheme, I created an annual task that occurs in the mid to late fall that has a list of these actions that I need to perform. And I have to check them off of the task and close the task before I know all of those things are completed. So that would be an example of an in inappropriate way to use a note and how to properly use a task to kind of give you an example of the difference between the two. Hopefully that, that uh, kind of gives you a guide. So I'll, I'll again uh, pause there for a moment so I can take a sip of water and see if there's any questions about anything we've talked about or notes up to this point. And if not, we're going to jump into tasks. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the okay. first one is um, many times in IT, if I do not answer an email within 30 minutes, I receive a phone call from a user. And typically it is an emergency, but they don't know if I received the email. If I turn my notifications off, I believe I'll just continue to receive more interruptions. Do you know how I can combat that? That's a, that's a great question, whoever asked that one. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's a hard question to, to answer, actually, because a lot of what I'm talking about here is um, work situation dependent, right? So for me as a business analyst, I don't have those direct user contacts that require me to have a, a user to have immediate access to me, so to speak. And so for somebody who may be part of a service desk or an IT department where they're required to do that, operating within that part of this scheme may be difficult. And so um, what I will say, I guess at a high level is, and this is a bit of a, a soapbox answer, is in my opinion, Email was never designed to be an instant notification tool. I believe that walking over to somebody's desk or picking up the phone or even in today's day and age texting somebody or maybe you use a tool like Jabber that we do is a way to instantly communicate with somebody. Um, and I do not operate under a scheme where I, I expect or expect other people to operate 
with email being an instant notification tool. How many of us have somebody who sends an email and then with a minute, within a minute, they're standing in front of you? Hey, Evan, did you see the email I just sent you? Well, if you wanted to talk to me, I would much rather you get off your butt and come down to my office and be standing in front of me than send me an email because I'm not, as you can see from this team, I'm not st sitting in my inbox all the time. So some of that is, again, a cultural change. When I instituted this Outlook optimization scheme, I never communicated to my colleagues and to the people that I work with, internal and external customers, that I'm not going to be monitoring their email every second. I just started operating in a methodology that if I needed you immediately, I walked over to your desk and talked to you. I'm, I'm looking at Ty, right? When I need Ty, I walk over to him and ask for his help. I don't send him an email and expect him five minutes later to respond to it. So some of that is kind of a cultural shift where I feel like I've become a leader in my organization in trying to change the culture to say email is not the instant notification tool that a lot of people think it is. Um, and I have personally not had too much trouble with that in my work career. And again, if somebody has that issue because they're required by their job to be immediately available by their users, it's going to be harder to institute that type of a turn off notification. So hopefully that provides a little um, feedback as to how you'd handle that situation. Just to piggyback onto the answer real quick. Uh, so from a you know third party perspective, now that I understand Evan's behavior, I understand that if I send him an email, I, he may not see until the end of the day. Uh, I've also changed my behavior to Evan, right? So if I know that I have an urgent issue that Evan needs to look at immediately, I will either walk to his you know, uh, desk, I will pick up the phone, I will make sure I do every, uh, every other alternative to reach Evan and get his attention. Uh, if it's not urgent, I send him an email, I tell him a task, I, I give him an assignment, whatever the case may be, and I understand that he's going to triage that accordingly to you know whatever his work schedule is. Uh, so I think that behavior is modified a little bit, but more effectively, in, in a way, it's categorizing that behavior as well. Thank you, Ty. Sam, you mentioned another question. Um, I think we're all good with the questions at the moment. OK. I'm going to keep uh, marching on here so that we can talk about tasks. So I, I keep mentioning this, this function within Outlook uh, called tasks. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the big buttons at the bottom here, right, tasks. M many of you probably don't use that because you're trying to create a to-do list uh, through what we mentioned before, uh, triaging your inbox or putting a reminder on your calendar that says, hey, uh, fill out my timesheet every day or make a call to so-and-so. But there's this other really, really powerful function within Outlook called tasks. And the way that you create a task is, as I mentioned before, you hit Control-Shift-K, your shortcut, or go to the task function and hit New Task. And here's how you do it. So I'm going to quickly talk through this, and I'm going to take you into the task and show you how you actually do it. First thing you want to do is give the task a name. Um, I always start my tasks with an action verb, which I'll talk about in a minute. You're going to assign that task to one of the categories that you develop to help, again, kind of group things together. You're going to assign a realistic due date. I want to talk about that as well. So hold that thought for a minute. And then within the body of the task, you're going to start to type in a date for the notes that you're going to take or the actions that you're going to, that you're going to take. And you're going to begin to embed all of this um, multimedia content so that everything is included in one place. And within that body, you can include Outlook items, like emails. You can include hyperlinks. As I mentioned earlier, you can include actual files itself. You can include screenshots or uh, things of that nature. So a lot of uh, very uh, dynamic electronic content. So that step that I just showed you, this is the same step showing an actual task. And it also shows you the cadence that I create within the task itself and how I create kind of um, a history of the sub actions that I perform within that task. Um, it's reverse chronological. So it's from most recent to, old, to oldest. You can see in here that I have actual emails embedded or hyperlinks. And then as I complete that specific 
action within this task, I, I boldly put the word done in there so I know that that particular action is completed. If it doesn't have that in front of it, I know that that's still an open action. And then I'm taking notes along the way to key into what it is that I'm trying to accomplish. So I'm going to open up a task of my own. This one happens to be for this uh, session that we're performing today is to perform Outlook optimization tasks. So again, subject up here, you want to put in some verbiage with an action verb. I use the due date here, and then this is the body of the task where you can see a number of pieces of multi-media uh, information in here. So let's kind of start from the top down. Why an action verb? So if this task simply said Outlook optimization class, what would that mean to you? It probably means a number of things to a number of people because it doesn't tell you anything about what you're actually doing. So if I change that word perform to the word schedule, it has a different connotation, right? So I'm in the process of scheduling this session for today. It would have had the word schedule here. And when we got to the point where it was scheduled and I was getting ready to perform it, I changed that action verb. So it helps you easily and at a quick glance know where you stand on that particular action. So that's number one. Number two, down here in the section where you have your, your start and due date, status, priority, and percent complete, I am an advocate of using only one of those five indicator, and that's due date. I don't use the start date, and I never set status or priority. If it's an action that I need to perform, it's important. So I don't need to know what priority it is. It's just one of those extra things that to me takes up time that doesn't, that doesn't really add value to the task. And I don't really care when I started this task. All I want to know is, know is when it's due. And so why that date is also very, very important, I'm going to close it for a minute and show you why. When you look at your calendar, this task view down here at the bottom is managed by Outlook's due date. And why that's critical is if for some reason I don't complete a task today. I just don't get around to finishing it. If I leave that due date alone, so today's the 7th and I leave it alone, when I come in tomorrow on the 8th, the very first task that pops up in this task list, and it will be highlighted in red because it's overdue, is the task from the previous day. So it gives me a quick prioritization of the things that are overdue if for some reason I don't get to them. So it's a great tool for managing your tasks and knowing the prioritization and when it needs to be done. So on a daily basis, if I don't get to a task, I can either leave that date alone, it'll pop up the next day, so I never lose track of that task, which is a great feature. Right? I'm letting Outlook do the heavy lifting for me, if you will, so I don't have to remember. Or I can simply, if I wanted to, change the date to tomorrow's date towards the end of the day as I do my end of day triage and setup for the next day. If I change that date, It'll disappear off my calendar view, you can see here. And when I come in tomorrow, it'll simply be waiting for me in that task view for the next day. So that realistic day and managing of those dates, those due dates, is really important. Why I mentioned the word realistic is also important because if you simply on a daily basis take your tasks and say, oh, I didn't get to this today, I'm going to just put tomorrow's date on it. Tomorrow always becomes tomorrow, and tomorrow always becomes tomorrow. And next thing you know, you have a list of 20 tasks or more that you're trying to accomplish. And now it becomes overwhelming, and, and it's hard to manage that prioritization on a daily basis. I would much rather, at the end of my day, take maybe 10 minutes to do an end-of-day triage, look at the remaining open tasks that I have, if there are any, and look at it and say, OK, Evan, when is the next realistic time I'm going to work on this? And if it's tomorrow, put tomorrow's date. If it's not tomorrow, put a date out in the future. And again, what Outlook will do for you is manage those days so I don't have to juggle all those balls of thinking about tomorrow what I need to do. If it's, if it's Thursday, fine. If it's Friday, fine. If it's a month from now, fine. It will simply pop up on my calendar on that day a month from now, and I'll take a look at it again. Again, the flexibility and beauty of that is if I push something off into the future, let's say, because uh, I'm waiting on information from a work colleague and I don't expect to get it for a week because they're on vacation. So I'll put it out for a week. 
if for some reason that person provides me the information or I get the answer to my question before that week is up, I can always go into my task list and find it and put the, embed that information and then simply pull that task forward to a more current date. So again, it gives you a lot of flexibility for how you use this. The other thing I wanted to show you here is how you actually go about embedding some of that multimedia information. So once you're here in the body of the task, if I want to embed an email, again, I can do it from a number of ways. I have this little quick access bar up here that allows me to embed information directly. But all you have to do is go to Insert, which is one of the tabs across your email, go to Outlook Item, and it will always, by default, open up in your inbox. And I can simply select this item, maybe, that I want to embed and hit OK. And you can see that it's embedded here now. When I click on it, it's as if I'm in my inbox and opening up that email. What's important to note here when you do that is this is an exact copy and duplicate of the email itself. Okay, it's not the embedded email. So if I embed it here and hit save, and I go back to my inbox, it's still in there. When I delete this and go back to the task, whoops, sorry, I opened up the wrong, wrong one. Which is the one that, I don't even know which one I had open. I think you were on the A. Oh, yes, I was on the A. Sorry. You can see that it's embedded in there. Right? So you never lose the information. And the benefit of including it in the task here is this task becomes a repository for all the information related to that task, whether it's the verbiage that you can see that I type in here, it's the embedded emails to create that kind of chain of custody, if you will, or it's um, a hyperlink. I have all the information I need about that task in one place, and I never have to go elsewhere to look for it. So this becomes a really, really powerful tool. And then the really cool thing you can do afterwards is if you want to pass this information on to somebody else, you can simply copy this task into an email, send it to somebody else, and have them op um, drag and drop it into their own task list they have access to all of this information as well. So because it's multimedia content, content, it's completely shareable with anybody else. So again, very, very powerful stuff uh, with how this tool is used and the sharing of that information. When you complete one of these tasks, you never lose that information. So it's another important thing. I want to go back in time a couple of days here. So if I go back in time to December 6th and I have a, this task in here, you can see that there's a strike through font. I can still open it up. I can still open up the emails. I can still hit the hyperlink that takes me directly to the website that I needed to. I never lose that content. It's always there. And if you go even into a week long view, anything in the past that I've completed has a strike through font. I can always go back and reference, it, reference those tasks. And more importantly, I can even uncomplete those tasks. And if I do that, if I uncomplete a task, it will simply populate into today's view. And I can begin to use that task, in essence, recycle it over again and use that content or add to it because I thought the task was completed and now it's not. So there's a lot of really powerful content with these tasks. Evan? Well, yes, Sam. We have um, a couple of questions that relate to that. And it's um, basically, if you have tasks, how do you keep track of them that aren't due for a long time, but you want to be reminded? Or um, you know, how do you know that you need to start now, but they're due in a week? OK, that's a good question. So um, because I'm using this due date, which, again, to, um, from my perspective, doesn't tie necessarily to the due date of a, of a task, per se. Uh, to me, I manage what, what, what is called due date, what the scheme manages due date is, the next time you are realistically going to action the task. You may choose to, at the top of your, um, within your task, at the body of it, you can put a due date in here, right? Like, so I could put in here.
and to know that. You could do that. Um, but it's, it's, bit, it's a bit of a judgment call, right? So if something's not due for six months, but you know you need to start working on it two months from now, the date that I'd put for it to pop up on my calendar is when I would next want to work on it. Not the due date six months from now, but the date two months from now when I want to start working on it. So that's kind of one way to, to hopefully manage it so that you don't miss out on those deadlines. So it's, the, it's whatever scheme you get comfortable with to realize when that due date is and think about how much time it's going to take you to work on it and set those realistic expectations of when you want to work on things. Sometimes the realistic expectation is I literally need to do something every single day. And so I simply change the due date from day to day to day knowing that I'm going to work on it on Thursday. And tomorrow when it's Thursday, I'm going to push it to Friday because I'm going to do something on it on a Friday. And that's okay. But again, create realistic days so that you really feel confident you're going to work on it and you're not simply pushing a task from day to day to day. Another question, Sam? I know we're getting no, short on time. It. Okay. So the next couple of steps I'm really going to kind of jump over, but really what it talks about is using Outlook to forge new habits, and all of this is about new habits. Um, creating a task that is recurring. I have a task that pops up every single day that is using the recurring function, and it even has an alarm that pops up on my screen at 430 in the IT department here at Vitamix, we're required to track our time. And instead of waiting to the end of the week, I like to do it on a daily basis because I uh, keep current that way. And so I have a reminder that pops up on my screen, kind of like a calendar reminder that says, time to perform your task of entering time into Mr. TikTok, which is the tool we use. And it pops up on my screen at 4.30 every day. So using these tasks as a means to create uh, new habits and forging new habits, really, really powerful and important. The next couple of slides I'm not going to spend any time on, but there is a way to create different views of your task list once you start creating all these tasks that make it easily searchable by topic or by time, by date. And so the ta steps 11 and 12 tell you how to create those views in your version of Outlook. They're already there. This just shows you how to customize them to create them into these other views to view uh, by date and by topic uh, so that you can find them easily if you need to. I mentioned earlier in the presentation the keep folder and uh, this step 13 shows you how to create that keep folder and a place to dump those emails uh, if you want to keep them for a while before you purge or archive them at some point in the future for the things that you're not really sure if you're going to need. But you can then keep them out of your inbox and keep your inbox clean. Uh, step 14 here I did mention very, very briefly is the quick access toolbar which is this kind of one step click um, once you have, for instance, a task open if I want to embed an email. Instead of having to go to insert, I can just click this button. Shows you how to get to there. Um, quick steps are something that are, for those of you that are familiar with it, they're macros. Uh, this step shows you how to set up a macro to do a, a, a grouping of steps within Outlook if you choose. So I'll leave that to you. And this shows you how to actually set up that macro. So there's two screens for step 15. And then step 16 is the last step in this part of the presentation that talks about, gosh, Evan, this is overwhelming, but I'm interested in doing it. How do I get started? So it talks about kind of how you get started um, in cleaning your inbox, right? So this all starts with the inbox and how do you get away from drinking from that fire hose and, and creating a scheme. There's really two ways to do it. You can either just pick a point in the sand and say, I'm going to start from this moment forward cleaning everything in my inbox and triaging it from this point going forward and creating this task scheme. Or you may try the other methodology, which is kind of hard to do, is to kind of take an initial triage view of your inbox and dumping things that you're not sure that you need out of them into your keep folder and then start triaging the stuff that's in there for the things that are top of mind from a task perspective and start creating those tasks and try to create a connection to the actions that you need to perform. It, 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 it tends to be kind of overwhelming other, either way, which is why I said here, feeling like this step is going to take a long time, it's right. 
but nothing of value is free. It's, it's hard to get started in this scheme. I'm going to say that because um, there's a lot of effort required up front to institute this scheme. Um, but it's totally worth it to do it. Um, and I would highly recommend you take a go at it. I guess what I will offer uh, here on this last sheet, I'll go through a couple of these, but if you're interested um, in doing this and you're scared about getting started or you have any other further, further questions, I will offer you my, <coughs> excuse me, my work email address, which is efleischer at vitamix.com, E-F-L-E-I-S-H-E-R at vitamix.com. And I'm happy to answer questions or help you get started. I kind of needed a mentor to get started, and I'm happy to do that for any and all of you if you need. Um, I know we're getting very short on time here, so I want to offer some quick parting tips. Um, learning time protection is OK. You know, it's often OK to say no or not at this time, uh, to focus on those things that are truly value added that you're working on. I try to reserve the early morning hours of my day to work on those calendar and task uh, actions and don't look at email to get sucked into that reactive mode. I want to work on the stuff that's important and set my day up for success. Really just know that multitasking is a myth. You need to, as I mentioned throughout the beginning parts of my presentation, find calm single point focus and a way to work on high priority tasks and actions and projects. And the last thing I'll kind of put into your head as a challenge is Try to create what I call the day before vacation mentality every day. We all know that day before vacation where you say, come hell or high water, I'm going to get these things completed because I don't want to deal with them while I'm on vacation. What if you uh, did that every single day of your work life and said, today, no matter what, I'm going to get these things done. So <laughs> don't work on 20 tasks. Work on three or four or five really important tasks and make progress on them, maybe not necessarily finishing them. Some of them are longer term, but make progress on everything every single day. And turning that information into action and creating results is what's going to create the success for that, that you're going to have in your, in your job or in your day-to-day -day life and in your, in your world. So I think I'll kind of leave you on that parting tip. Um, I wish you all the best of luck in um, putting this scheme into place in your own world. And uh, if you need help, I'm here in any way that I can. And I guess, Sam, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Evan. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for taking your time to present this to us. And hopefully we got some great advice. Well, I know we have great advice, but hopefully we all take the time to use this to you know, go home without worrying anymore. Um, so since we're out of time, I just want to let you know if you weren't able to copy down Evan's email, you can email me, and I will be happy to send um, you his email or help answer any questions that you may have. Um, and as well, the presentation has been recorded, and I will be putting this out on our website at um, oug.org slash membership slash um, it's on the Young Professionals under the Membership tab. Um, so you'll get a, you can um, review those slides. Um, and if you did need the handouts, I'll also put those up for you, or you can email me, and I'd be happy to help send those if you didn't have a chance to download them. Um, so you should get an email from me after this presentation um, that you'll be able to send any questions you may have to me, and then I can forward them on to Evan. All right. So I just want to thank you all for attending, and um, if you have any questions, send them over. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time, everybody. I really appreciate it.